This panel will be moderated by John D'Agostino. John is a former head of strategy at the New York Mercantile Exchange. He's a senior advisor to Coinbase. He sits on the board of directors of Polychain, Block Tower, Coin Fund, and Asymmetric. And perhaps most interestingly, is a subject of two New York Times best-selling books. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Excellent. All right. We're going to have some interaction today, so be, be live. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. We've got a really cool panel uh, because we have representatives from both the developer side as well, as well as the business side. So how NFTs will be created as well as how they'll be used uh, for customer engagement. So we're just going to dive in. We're going to do very, very brief uh, intros, look these people up. They all have incredible backgrounds. Um, but uh, we'll start with a generic question around this debate over, and then introduce yourself at the beginning of your, of your answer. Uh, this debate over whether um, NFTs is financing vehicles for the creation of art. You know, my, my daughter over here is a, is a budding artist. And I said recently, if all NFTs accomplish, and I don't think this is actually true, but if all NFTs accomplish is creating a better and more efficient financing vehicle for the creation of art, the world will be a demonstrably better place when she's my age. But when we think about how much these things cost and the value associated with them and how companies, like the one you'll talk about, Louise, um, will, um, cre come on, will create uh, um, NFTs that are utilized by companies, uh, the question comes up, do NFTs need utility to exist? So, Raven, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Raven. I'm a generative artist from Boston. Uh, Closer. You got to get really up there. Check. There we, go. there we go. Hi, I'm Raven. I'm a generative artist from Boston. Uh, I've done two projects on Artblocks, uh, Moments, and Pieces of Me. Um, and uh, to answer your question, I think you know, just the in the history of art, you know, it's it's really amazing this moment that we're in with NFTs, especially on the royalty part of the equation, because. You know, in the history of art, a lot of times artists have, you know, become, you know, well known maybe later in their life or even, you know, uh, you know, after they're long gone, you know, that they've uh, reached, you know, kind of critical appreciation. Um, however, you know, with this, you know, this on chainness of NFTs and the royalty structure that's brought that's built into it, um, it really allows for uh, artists to continue to be paid as far as when their art is resold. So a lot of times, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of artists have, have given away their kind of masterworks for almost close to nothing. And then, you know, all that in the secondary market is where all the, the kind of price action happens, right? And none of that money goes back to the artist to continue to create great work. Um, so well, this- Sorry, Raven, why, but why not? Isn't, isn't part of the functionality that the secondary market can automatically pay a, pay a VIG back to the, back to the founder? Yeah, not not in the traditional art. Oh, so traditional, right? Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying in the traditional art world. But you know, in this space of Web three and NFTs, you know, like that's built into the mechanism. So when things are sold on an on an NFT marketplace like OpenSea or something like that, that you know, five percent goes right back into the artist's wallet, which is um, continuing to fund uh, work. So the economics of it, like you said, you know, uh, is really uh, a game changer as far as. Um, like you said, your daughter to be able, and other artists to continue to make a living from this and to have the incentives to continue to, to elevate the art. Right, okay, so, so Juan, you're, you're creating, uh, you're using NFTs uh, for your airline, airline business that embed both functionality and then also potentially some uh, artistic value or metaphorical value. Um, how important is that? And how will, how will customers who think of these as not just pure artistic holdings, but think of these as functional utilities, like an airline ticket. Uh, what's, wh how do those two meet? Okay, I, I mean, I, I'm definitely I'm, uh, not coming from the art uh, NFTs uh, space. I'm coming, I'm a travel veteran. Uh, I have yeah, al almost 30 years on, on the travel industry. And what we're doing is we're tokenizing travel assets, starting with air tickets. And basically what we are creating our NF tickets that are the, the new evolution of the of 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 our tickets. And I think 
there are so many efficiencies and th so much value that can take not only for the suppliers, the airlines, but also to the, to the travelers and any kind of intermediaries that I think it's r really important ha that how NFTs can create this, not only make more efficient the, the current business rules, but also create new business rules as uh, we were just talking, you know, travel doesn't have a secondary market, but you know, using NFT tickets or uh, NFTs can enable you know, the airlines keep on collecting revenues any, any time that uh, an, a ticket, an NFT ticket is sold. So I think it's really important to start finding out all the use cases that you know, every industry may have for NFTs and not only the, the art industry. Give, that, give the example you told me. How will your customers use NFTs? OK, you know, the, the first thing that we, we did you know, about man, one month uh, ago, we have done the the first ever auction of our NF ticket. You know, we have, and what we did, we within that uh, NFT, you 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 can get the right to travel on a specific flight on business class from uh, Europe to Miami, you know, to our, our Basel, plus uh, an our piece itself done by uh, Carlos Betancourt. Plus, you know, the NFT ticket holds the capacity to unlock experience at Miami itself. So there are, that NFT ticket has everything embedded, and it, it was like a new type of NFT ticket, you know, crossing utilities from different industries. Right. So, so Shane, you're, you're building a new layer one to build NFTs. So, show of hands, who knows what layer one means? Who doesn't know, sorry, who doesn't know what layer one is? Of course, the MIT crowd. All right, we got, some, we got some people. Explain what a layer one is very briefly, and then explain why you need to build a new one when we've got five or six functional ones currently. Sure. Uh, hey, folks, Shane, uh, founder of Stargaze. So uh, a, a layer one is a blockchain that's dedicated to a specific task, right? So Bitcoin is really um, a, a dedicated blockchain for, for payments. Um, and, uh, you know, you can build other stuff on top of Bitcoin, too, but it's really kind of specialized for payments, right, and cross-border payments and stuff like that. Um, Ethereum uh, is another layer one that's kind of more generalized. You can build kind of anything on it, but none of those things are, the blockchain isn't specific to any one thing that's built on it, right? Um, as a layer one chain for NFTs, you can kind of hyper-focus on it and, uh, kind of build functionality that are unique to NFTs. And um, like, for example, Stargaze has zero gas, right? And a huge problem right now in Ethereum is gas fees. Um, so for those of you who don't know what layer ones are, gas is, gas is the cost of doing that transaction on that blockchain. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, I just wanted to get back to your earlier point about, um, you know, about the utility uh, and, and art, right? The art industry does about $50 billion of value a year. Right, and and right now there's like gatekeepers for it. So there's Sotheby's and other auction houses that are that are gate gatekeepers. Right, um, NFTs can really make that process more democratic, and uh, really just get a lot more people into the space. And uh, just on Stargaze, you know, we've only been our launch pad's been around for eight weeks, and uh, there's been like 85 collections that are already launched on it, and um, our like artists have made a ton of money just like you know minting their collections on it. Raven, you're, you're a developer and an artist. Most artists are not developers, however. So how much of a problem is this? How much of a problem are you know, the diversity of, of chains, the of layer ones, the problem with gas fees? Like, how much of an impediment is this to broad scale adoption? Well, I think it's, it's when we talk about layer ones and gas fees and things like this, I think it's very relevant to what you're trying to do, right? The, the, I think when you compare it to a Sotheby's or one of these big auction houses, you know, and you're dealing with kind of fine art, high value art, um, the gas fees don't matter as much, right? Because uh, compared to an auction house, you know, their cut of, of, a, of a take, uh, the gas fees are, are you know, for well, the most, most of part. the time, right? Most of the time. Board Apes Ape spent 33 and a half yeah. percent on gas fees. Sotheby's is not 33 and a half percent commission, but you're right. Most of the time. I'm saying I agree. like on a secondary sale, like on OpenSea or something for, like that. Absolutely. You know, um, 
you know, the hundred dollars in gas fees, you know, to, to, yep. to make that sale, you know, if it's a high value asset, you know, is going to be nothing compared to, um, what the auction house is going to take. So, um, I think it's, it's very rele relevant to, um, to what the, you know, what's, what is the, um, you know, use case, right? Like, but if you're, if you're having things that are, um, you know, are, have a, a large addition or, you know, uh, someone that's just up and coming and they're, they want to sell their, their art for, you know, um, 50 cents a piece or something like that, then the gas fees obviously because of the scale uh, become very significant and almost or prohibitive, right? Uh, for those, those kind of projects to be launched. Um, so I think it's really a context of, 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 what what is the chain or the L L one used for, and what what is it what's being uh, you know traded or interacted with uh, determines you know how much that gas fee is a problem you know. So we'll give it to you one side real quick, Shane. What, what, so what what does yours do better? Um, well, so my my take on that is that most most art is not going to be high high value art, right? So there's definitely going to be uh, a, a certain sub subset that's going to be high high value. I think most normal people, their their transactions and their NFTs they're going to buy are going to be um, just a lot more minor things, you know, maybe just like access passes to like uh, a Discord channel or something like that, or like an avatar for their Twitter or something like that. Great, right? great, great segue. Yeah. So, so Juan, um, two questions. One is, do your customers care what L1 they're working on? Then I want you to talk a bit about this integration of utility and function. We talked about the cool stuff you're doing with your tickets. So let's start with this. Will your customers care what L1 they work on? Definitely not. I mean, I think that travel is a global industry, and basically, if you want to tackle, you know, the the old you know, old travelers in the world, we we need to uh, create an experience that doesn't have friction and it's not focused only on on crypto uh, and, and Web three users, uh, and that's why we have chosen you know coming to uh, connecting with the, the other the question we have chosen algorand that gives us the the cost and the the performance and also the sustainability sustainability that we want for our customers um, someone from MIT give me a heads up on time because there's no clock here so right you give me, give me give me a five for for questions give me a ten when there's questions okay okay so let's go let's go further so um, in a couple of years, when I buy an airline ticket or I go see an NFL game or something, I won't get a ticket stub. I'll get an NFT, right? Solves one problem, which is forgery. Fantastic. But that just seems a lot of, a lot of effort. Forgery is not that big of a problem to create a whole new ecosystem. So what other stuff can I expect in terms of that engagement with my airline, my sports team? Um, what else can we include in there to make it more interesting? Because right now, it sounds like a great deal for the companies. Right, Those printing costs go down, forgeries go down. How will the consumers benefit? And particularly, how will consumers who are grudgingly pulled into new tech, and this isn't just like 80-year-old people, right? This is people who are just too busy to learn a new, a new app or download some new tech. How, how are they gonna benefit from it? Okay, I, I think that as we have been talking about, I mean, uh, web-free communities like uh, very close and UX, UX and UI for web-free products are, are, are really focusing on the heavy users of Web3. And it's really important to understand how to uh, not only evangelize Web2 customers to get into Web3, but also Web3 developers in order to understand how to build products to these new, new customers. And, and, and that's behind all the benefits that web, you know, the, the travel customers can, can get for buying an asset that has liquidity and has new business rules that convert, you know, that that improves their experience of, of buying a traditional travel asset. I love you guys, but I usually have to stop people from speaking because they go too far, and you guys are all super succinct. This is great, <laughs> Raven. Let's talk about DeFi and NFTs. That's obviously the end goal. Yeah. Um, where are we now? And how long do you think it'll take to get there? And what are the advantages and disadvantages in the artistic community of DeFi versus centralized? Well, I think um, when I think of DeFi and kind of the artistic community, it's it's um, the main thing I, I think of first is you know kind of some of these um, lending platforms that have have uh, popped up. 
Um, and there's a few of them now. And, you know, they allow basically you to, if you have, you know, a certain NFT or something like that, you can actually get collateralized loans on it. And then, um, then from there, you know, uh, you have to, you know, pay it back in a certain amount of time. This is all on the blockchain as well. So all these rules are kind of like programmed in there to, uh, you know, um, to facilitate this whole lending. Um, and then there's also the other thing I think of is tokenization, right? Of, of some of these high value NFTs, like, um, you know, I know Grailer's DAO is, is one, is, is a DAO that, you know, has collected a lot of generative art. Um, and they have made, basically made an organization that, uh, which is, you know, they're collectively basically buying art um, and uh, high value art in the generative space and, uh, you know, tokenizing that so that uh, they can have a, a number of uh, owners um, okay. of that art. So I think that's, a, that's an example of DeFi. I think um, I'm, I, 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 I do pause a little bit because I think if we go too far down this path, I think you end up, you know, uh, going to where, you know, we could get to a point where, you know, things are just, the values are crazy and everything's tokenized and no one really owns anything. No individuals own them or very few. And I can see that to me that that would be almost like a, a bad thing, you know? Um, also, what yeah. about curation? I mean, look, if you write software that can produce a billion pieces of art per second, yeah. um, we have an infinite amount of art flying around, which is you know, wonderful for the world, but how do you curate that? How do you know where the value lies? So I'm actually gonna, like, a quick answer and then I wanna move yeah. to Shane. I think that's really important. I think um, that's why, you know, for example, on Artblocks, they have a curation board of, of uh, you know, 20, I think it is, of art experts, other artists, um, collectors, and these are really people that I, I think, and it's really great that they are way before, you know, they've been in art way before NFTs and, you know, they really have bring to that board, you know, a, a critical, um, appreciate a deep critical knowledge and appreciation of art. So um, I think that's really important, um, you know, that there is that th those type of people and we are engaging the kind of quote unquote traditional art world where because they, they have a tremendous amount of expertise on on what is valuable, what's 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 culturally relevant. Um, uh, and, and, and all that, so. Definitely. So real quick, before Shane, how, how many people here own NFTs? Okay, I keep doing the wrong question. How many people don't own NFTs? About a third, two, okay. Um, Shane, how do, how do we write code that gets those folks interested and feeling comfortable purchasing these assets? I mean, the way to solve that problem is not have them write code at all, right? They can just go to a website and click a few buttons and, uh, and uh, you know, either launch a collection or mint an NFT and just make the UX super, super easy, right? Uh, but I just want to I just want to get back to curation. Uh, you know, um, for curation to be done well, you need humans and people involved in that picture, right? And it's a really, really uh, it's a hard problem to solve because. Um, in a decentralized space, uh, a lot of people view that as everyone having kind of uh, the same view into everything and like everyone having kind of like the same access. Um, and it's weird having like gatekeeping and, you know, giving everyone the same view and access to like everything. Um, and so, so that's, that's kind of a hard problem to solve. Like you can have uh, like token voting, right? But then people like learn how to bribe that system and game that, game that system as well. Um, so I think I think we're 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 we're, we're all kind of still learning how to do that how to do that well. We talked about that. I mean, uh, yeah, real quick, and then I want to get. To yeah, I just wanted to say too is like you know that like in the way what the the model of curation that I just uh, kind of laid out with this curation board, you know, that's kind of contentious in this space, you know, because some people view that okay, well, we have things like DAOs, we have you know token voting, you know, we shouldn't have a, a, a art blocks curation board of experts, quote unquote. We should just have the community vote, right? Which is the other more um, kind of democratic yeah. way of that, doing it. That's not it, proven right? to work very well. Yeah. So, so it, far, but, but people argue that. So it's it's a it's a you know it's a it's a, I think and they have they have merit to argue that. So I think it's an important discussion that we need to continue to have. Is is should there be art experts or should there or should it be more of a community curation? Right. So so my expertise is price discovery exchanges. 
And I can tell you right now, if you have, uh, so we talk about in the exchange world of having a, a broad versus a deep market. So a broad market is you log on to an exchange, you want to buy or sell an asset. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a piece of computer code or uh, a widget. Um, and you see lots of volume. You see lots of liquidity, lots of buys and sells. You go, oh, this is a healthy market. You know, it's, it's trading a lot. You know, I only have five to sell, and it's selling in 100,000 blocks. It trades like water. It's very liquid. But you go one level deeper, and you realize every single market participant is of the same type. It's not deep. Qu quick story. In 2008, Hurricane Katrina devastated the city of Houston. I was head of strategy for the New York Mercantile Exchange, where the world's most valuable commodities trade. One of those is called natural gas. We had a very deep natural gas market. If you wanted to sell a million bucks in natural gas, not a problem. 2009, Hurricane Rita hit the city of Houston. First time in its history it was evacuated. All that liquidity dried up. Because it turned out most of it was a bunch of hedge funds sitting in Houston trading with each other. It wasn't deep. You didn't have contrarian positions. And I worry sometimes that these communities are filled with true believers, and that's wonderful. But if you don't have contrarian, if you don't have shorts, you don't have price discovery. So just, just food for thought. I, I, I don't yeah. think you've been in our Telegram then. <laughs> that, that's fantastic. No, I think wonderfully, I haven't. You're right, fair enough. That, but, but, but I credit to you for building a community of contrarians. I think that's great. So let's talk about DeFi. It's, it's hard enough to get customers to do anything new. right? You change the color of the tickets, you probably get a bunch of phone calls and complaints. So how are you gonna take your customers, your airline customers, through this journey to eventually wind up in a decentralized world? Or do you, do you need to? Uh, I mean, I think that in, in, in the travel industry, but I think that in, in any industry that has distrib distribution process or supply chain where, where y you need, it's a, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> she hates DeFi. She gets very upset. <laughs> she's, just, she's a centralized universe. Um, she's FUD. She's all FUD, I'm not gonna lie, you know. <laughs> Okay, so as I was telling, you know, uh, most, both the, the travel industry, but any industry that, that can, you know, use NFTs on their distribution strategy or on their supply chain, I mean, uh, there's a huge opportunity to use those NFTs as collaterals to, uh, to get liquidity for, from the market. And a, a very simple use, think about it, you know, all this process of, uh, all, all this pay now, uh, pay, uh, buy now, pay later uh, model that, you know, it's great for travel and we are developing this because, you, you know, you, you get an, uh, an NFT that you will use it in, I don't know, six months. Though, so in the meantime, there can be liquidity pools, liquidity lending protocols, whatever, or even the supplier that, I'm, that can use, you know, these NFTs as collaterals to finance any stakeholder along the, uh, 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 along the process. Now, we'll stay on you for a second. So, so uh, part of the, obviously, interest in, in replacing uh, physical tickets, for example, with NFTs is the fungibility, right? You can resell, and then for artists, you get a 5%. Now, for things like airlines, you can't just, I can't just resell my, I can't buy a ticket to Chicago and then just sell it to somebody at the airport like a scalper would at an NFL game. Um, does that decrease the utility? Does that make it harder to build the use case for switching over? I, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not easy, but at, at, the same, at the same point, there are so many, so many benefits linked to ch totally change, like, I mean, it's, it's a paradigm change. You know, it's, it's what thinking about, like, decentralizing distribution, letting users, you know, or buyers do whatever they want, uh, let new uh, users and like uh, traders and you know to, to get into into the market. So if 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 you see all you know how all the way that we are make, making all this much more efficient, but in the way where we are taking friction on, on the traveler side, I mean this uh, it's will help grow the the industry and. You know the the trade-off between the benefits and and the, the pros and cons. It's 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 starting let airlines and other travel suppliers to understand that this is the right way to go, and al also to be the capable of distributing NFTs and absolutely different channels as as yeah. Binance or Coinbase or 
OpenSea or Amazon, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you mentioned like this, uh, this paradigm shift, right? Sometimes it's hard to get users to make that leap. Um, a couple years ago, I spoke in a panel at a pension fund conference, and there was a, the pension CIO from the state of New Orleans. And he mentioned that how 98% or 100% of his pensioners get direct debit. They don't get a physical check. And the other pension CIO is like, oh, I wish I, oh, that'd be great. You know, I got all my old pensioners. They'll never accept that. And he paused and he said, well, after, after the hurricanes, 42% or so of citizens didn't have homes. You literally couldn't mail a check. And he said, he said something I'll never forget. He said, you'd be amazed how quickly even the most reticent adopter of technology learns something new when it's the difference between eating and not eating. Then, when things normalized, they had to make a business decision. They said, we're not going back. You've learned it, you've used it, we're not retreading those, that, that path. So I wonder, and I'm gonna surprise you with this, is, is there, and I'll, Shane, I'll, uh, Shane, I'll go you for a second. It, do we need that sort of paradigm shift? Or, and if we don't have it, how long is it gonna take to train, again, not, not, the, not the believers, you know, everybody else. I'm a believer and I'm, I'm, I don't wanna download anything new. I don't want any new apps. I'm just, I'm done, I'm mapped out. I've got like 19 different messaging apps, I'm done. So how do you get someone like me who's embraced, is excited, but just, is just so just annoyed at changing something? You saw my, you saw my kids, they, forget it. I got, all my time is spent wrangling them. How do you get someone like me on that? on that paradigm shift? I mean, it looked like the technology is, uh, you know, in, it's still in the very early phases, is a little clunky, and uh, it's, it's taking some time to make the UX really great, right? But it's getting there. Um, um, after Ethereum moves to proof of stake, uh, everything will be a little faster. Um, some of the newer proof of stake blo blockchains are a lot faster. Um, you still have to deal with wallets and stuff like that, but that's also getting a lot, a lot easier. Um, and then if you don't want to go that route, you can always use like a Coinbase or a centralized exchange, but that, that gap is definitely narrowing. Um, I, can, I tell from your tone you're and, not a fan of <laughs> centralized exchange. Well, exchanges. I mean, it, it's, it's just something that's going to take time. Right. I, I, I hear you. Um, Shane. So, so Raven, <laughs> sorry. I just met everybody in the green room. Bear, bear with me. Raven, uh, thoughts on this? Well, I think it's... Um it's a good point. I think, I think one of the things too is like with like the way L1s evolve, I think we need to make, it's going to take time, right? And I think um, it's with, you know, we got to make it a better user experience, right? First and foremost. I think the, the NFT landscape right now is still, um, you know, it, it favors people that have a technical uh, tech background or, you know, are, are at least a little bit tech savvy, you know, I, I'm not going to have my grandmother set up MetaMask and transfer Ethan and, and uh, buy something on OpenSea. I, I don't think so. She'd probably FUD that. <laughs> but we talked about it. I, ha I hate that term. Flex. Yeah, I, yeah, I just, yeah, I can't. You talk about I come from the weird. investment world and yeah. that's our job. Yeah. Our job is to look <laughs> critically at things. So um, I just find it very immature. But anyway, yeah. so, so, so I think I think we need to uh, like make these tools. I think in any any new technology that that comes along, this happens, right? Like it starts out with a few early adopters and people that really believe in the technology, and then you have a, a, a lot of people who are skeptical or you know just don't they don't have the either capability, time, or you know they just don't have enough people to, like they haven't heard of it. Um, and I think over time, this all these tools we built out to kind of interact with this these this you know this technology that will make it much easier you know to kind of buy nfts sell nfts um buy them in fiat you know you don't have to get go and and, and load up your you know uh wallet you don't have to maintain security over your own seed phrase all these things are going to be kind of abstracted out and and it's going to allow a, a larger uh you know group of people to kind of uh, enter this community yeah, I mean, look, it's public, public knowledge, publicly disclosed. Coinbase has launched their beta version of, uh, of our NFT exchange. I mean, I do, I, do, I do think, at least for that first stage of adoption, um, uh, a trusted public entity is going to be a, a safe place to store your customer's value. But that's my, that's my bias. Um, we have 13, 12, 13 minutes left. Uh, maybe a quick question. Uh, we got a question. Is that, was that a question in the back? You raised your hand? Um, so we got a couple questions. OK. Uh, how are we doing questions? Screaming them out and I'll repeat? What do you want to do? Uh, we'll start down here. Oh, sorry. 
So come, come down if you have a question, but we'll start. Who had a question up in the front? This gentleman. No, we're, we're not live? All right. I, call, I called him first, so you tell me your question, I'll repeat it. Go ahead. A, that's a fair, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, we're not going to mention any company names, all right? There's press here, and uh, we're not going to talk about any company names. But I think I'm going to genericize the question. Um, how, what should people be aware of in terms of ownership and value when purchasing NFTs? But we're not going to discuss any specific companies. I mean, when you, when you buy an NFT, you do a transaction on the blockchain, and that transaction record is there, right? Um, so you know... Uh, you can prove that with your key that you, uh, you know, made the purchase or trade or whatever, right? Um, I think you're maybe t uh, talking about like where the NFT is stored, right? So is it stored on like a centralized server that can go down at any time? Is it stored on something like IPFS that's long, long lived? Um, and, and yeah, that, you know, that, that, that could be a problem, right? Um, so um, we need like services maybe to like verify, to like maybe um, account for where the NFTs are stored, right? But um, at least, like, the purchase record is going to be on chain, right? And if there's, like, a governance action to change that, you, th there's still, like, some archive node running the history that still has that record of provenance, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're after that. No, Can sorry, I just right, answer no, that really John, quick? Gentleman with the mic, and then... Oh, okay. All right, go ahead. John, go ahead. I just wanted to just say oh, yeah, one please. thing on that. Raven, because, please. you know... What I, the art I do is on-chain generative art, and I think like something that's really great about that, and why I'm so excited about that is that you know we it's on, like my code is on-chain. So, and when you go to the Artblocks website and you view one of my pieces, um, it actually pulls the code from the blockchain from Ethereum and then renders that in real time in the browser. Um, so it's not going to the thumbnails are on IPFS and things like that, but you know, it's, it's something that's really cool about that. It's just like, you know, everything is on chain that is needed to render that, or that image. So, um, you know, and so even if IPFS goes down or goes away, you know, as long as that blockchain's up there, you know, 100 years from now, you know, people are going to be able to, they may have to use a browser from this time, but um, to render my art and see, see uh, you know, what, what my intent was creating the piece. So... Right. Things like that. So, John. Yeah, I'm a little confused. Are you guys going to build on Ethereum mainnet, or are you building on a different uh, layer? Uh, Stargaze. Yeah. Uh, Stargaze is its own own chain. So it's hold, only hold, hold on a second. Why would you not build on mainnet if 99% of the volume and activity is there? You know, we're right now building pseudo swap XYZ widget plugin. Yeah. Uh, with my DeFi team, GMX, and so we can have a plug-in, essentially, like you guys are talking about for the rails. Uh, okay, okay. Let him, let, him answer the, let him answer the question. Let him answer the question. Yeah. Please, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, there's, there's already OpenSea, and there's already plenty of marketplaces on Ethereum, right? We are building a layer one to solve a lot of the problems that they're having. We're not just trying to copy them and make another one. That wouldn't make sense, right? Avalanche, maybe. Um, we are building bridges from Ethereum to Stargaze, and um, because it's built as a Cosmos chain, you can talk to any of the other chains in that ecosystem because it, it has this um, transfer protocol that can transfer value between all those chains. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? So, one second, gentleman in the middle there, and then this gentleman here. Appreciate you guys today. So we've talked a lot about digital assets when it comes to NFTs, but right now I'm seeing a lot of physical assets being tokenized with NFTs. Can you guys describe how you guys see that going? You want, 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 want to take that? Yeah. I mean, I think that most industries, uh, 
really need to move on, you know, blockchain technology, and most of them have the capacity to use NFTs, you know, to, as I was saying, you know, improve, you know, the, the data integrity, data and traceability to improve their security, to create uh, new uh, use cases of, the, of their own assets. So basically, every day I'm, I'm I, you know, I, I walk on the street and, I'm, and I, I'm, I am seeing a lot of NFT use cases in both, you know, government politics, politics, health, uh, real estate, logistics. I mean, there are so many industries that will, for sure, will will be will embrace NFTs on a very near future. I actually speak a little bit to that, and just because I know there's press here, my opinions are my own and not that of Coinbase. Um, fractionalization, tokenization, whether it's NFTs or some other mechanism, uh, we've been trying this for years, by the way. When I was head of strategy for NYMEX, we used futures to break up into discrete increments, uh, products, experiences, things like that. Um, less efficient uh, than, than tokens, and I had a smaller audience. I had about 180,000 traders, we have billions of people, but the concept's not new. And the one thing I will, I will note is um, the attempt is to increase the friction associated with the transaction in the hope that you will buy more and buy more often. Uh, the, the reality is um, decreasing the friction of a transaction only helps if there's latent interest in that transaction. So just making it easier to buy your bad product doesn't necessarily make more people want to buy your bad product. Um, but if there's latent buy-sell interest and it's just locked in because there's, there's too much. When you, when you go to the grocery store, um, why do you think they have the candy at about three foot level when you get near the, the checkout counter? Why do you think that is? Exactly. So your kids start screaming. They create friction. What's the simplest way to decrease that friction? Buy the piece of candy. Right? So this has been going on for a very, every time there's a new in, uh, innovation in wearable technology for payments, what two companies' stock price goes up? Visa and MasterCard. Because the idea is that you'll just be easier to buy that widget, that thing. So decreasing friction works great if the kids want the candy. But if they put granola bars at three foot level, you wouldn't create that friction. So I think tokenization is wonderful, but it's not this panacea. It's not this solve all, right? It's still the quality of your product that ultimately matters. Um, anyone else want to comment on, on that or we move to a new question? Your next question. We're good. All right, uh, I think this gentleman. Uh, and then up there on the, on the left. Anybody else from, who, who else wants to ask a question? All right, you're, you're next. Yeah, cool. First of all, I love the dark pattern example of marketing to children at three feet off the ground. That's pretty awesome. Are they gonna talk about how we're dressed? Oh, no, I love that too, yeah, for sure. Um, so, I, if you can see my hat, you probably know what I'm going to ask. But NFTs are a privacy. It says privacy. It says privacy. So NFTs are a privacy nightmare. Uh, based on how they're currently constructed on every public by default blockchain. How do you guys think that that's impacting either adoption today or potential future adoption of new use cases by having, again, we're talking about friction. What does that lack of privacy look like in terms of the consumer friction? Do people actually notice or is it compromising things in ways that they might not be aware of but should be aware of? Good question. I think all three of you should address it. Uh, Raven, we'll start with you, privacy. Sure, I can go. Like, I think like, that's something that I think as you first get into this space, you quickly um, kind of realize that you know, this whole space is completely open, right? Like anyone can look up your wallet address and see how much is in there, what NFTs you own, um, things like that, which is just, at first it's, it's scary, but then you know, um, I think it's just something that personally you have to just buy into if you're in this space. I don't know if it will ever be saved I, I don't know if ever be completely mitigated against um, completely. Uh, I think there are obviously people that have are completely anonymous and you know um, things like that. You know, I'm I'm pseudonymous. You know, a lot of people know my name and do obviously my picture and stuff like that. But I go by Raven. Um, but uh, I think you can't you can't have a, a wallet that is completely you know you don't connect anything to you. You don't tell anyone what that it's your address. You don't have an uh, ENS name associated with it and things like that. So I think there's ways to still maintain, uh, you know, your privacy. But I think, you know, is it as private as, 
I don't know. There's, I think there's, I go back and forth on it because also like you think of a, the, the, the regular financial system. Can an employee at, you know, Bank of America look up my stuff? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I, I have no guarantee that. So I don't think the, the world in general is that private um, really, so I don't know. I, I have to think about okay. this more. It's it's saying, but yeah. Yeah, I want to leave one more question open for this young lady here. So let's, uh, Shane, you're up. Um, from my yeah. point of view, um, and, and, and NFTs are all about sharing and all about kind of flexing. Like people want to flex their NFTs. Um, we've, we, we have our community something like 70,000 big now. For, for and the parents in the room, flexing means showing off. <laughs> You know, not a single one of our users have asked about having NFTs that are private. You know, it's not just something that they want. Like, we, we operate like a startup, right? We, we built what our customers want, and none of them have asked for privacy okay. tech. Juan, is privacy dead? I, I, th I think that if you want to, you know, open up this to, you know, every industry, I don't think that privacy should be such an important uh, issue. To consider. Okay, we've, we've lost the guy with privacy on his hat, I'm sure. Yeah, that, um, it's a very good question. I appreciate it. It's a very important question. It's something that needs to be sacrificed, yeah. you know, for, I think, yeah. what, we're, what we're aiming for, yeah. which is decentralization, yeah. you know, yeah. which... L last question. <laughs> we can talk after. Apologies. Last question. This young, young lady here, I think... If, I'll, I'll try to get to you if we have time for one more. I apologize, but please. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm curious about, like, artists that are just starting out and they don't know much about NFTs. Like, what is the first step towards uh, bringing this technology to them? Let's do one quick answer, then I want this, yeah. this lady uh, to, uh, to answer as well. Sure, I think, I think uh, more and more even traditional artists are getting into NFTs now, and they're seeing the value of that. Um, and, you know, uh, I think in even artists that are starting out, right? I think it's one thing that OpenSea has done great is the ability to uh, actually, like, create art and upload it to OpenSea without actually minting it. So you don't have to pay the gas to get your art up on OpenSea. Um, the actual first collector pays the gas. So that makes it a little bit more accessible for people that are just starting out um, and they don't have that much money to invest in, in you know, getting their art on chain um, to at least get their art up there in, in front of collectors. So I think like that's something that they've really done. I think, I think um, it's just, and for general advice for artists just getting into space, you know, I think it's just, you know, like anything, networking, you know, get it, seeing other artists uh, work that you really like. Um, particularly me, I, I like to look at traditional artists in the past, too, and that, I, that really influences my work. So um, just viewing more art uh, and, and creating more art, you know, and I think the rest com can come if you follow that, you know, and, uh, and get yourself, okay. your, your art out there in okay. front Th of the right people. Thank you. L last question. Sorry, we're out of time. They're going to make sure my girls don't go to MIT if I go over. So uh, <laughs> you, you have the floor for the last question. Uh, thank you so much. This is a follow-up to Privacy Guy's question, um, which is, I feel like so much of the NFT market right now is about hype and it's about a bubble around selling JPEGs for thousands of dollars. And maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that five years from Selling now... Selling proof of ownership of great JPEGs yes, for correct. thousands of... But I don't think five years from now that that's going to be sustainable. And so my question is about how do we use NFTs to help people uh, with consumable content and making the NFTs actually not publicly viewable so that you can only view them if you've actually purchased them. And I ask that because I'm working on building a startup for content creators and models um, specifically helping sex workers uh, with their content. And obviously that's a group of people for whom privacy and making sure that only those who legitimately bought their content can see right. it is very so important. In fairness, th they've answered the question about privacy and none of them have consumer bases that care about that. So, but I wanna, I wanna be sensitive and respectful to your questions. So um, last comments, um, with the acknowledgement of what you said before, uh, if, if, if your community turns to you in a year and says, you know what, actually privacy does matter to us, what are your, what are your thoughts on how you might respond? Is that try, trying to get, try to get sure. something out of them? Because yeah, it, it's been I asked and answered to some is, degree. My question is more about the NFT market in general. Okay. I mean, the, so, so the market in general, like we're, we're, we're in the toy phase of it, right? We're in the early phase of it. And, and, and um, the early phases of these often do look like bubbles. Um, so uh, now, now is the time to build, and I'm more excited about what will come after this. So uh, you know that's kind of a hard question to answer, but it, it, we're, we're building the foundations and the infrastructure for the, for what would come next. 
Yeah, I think too is like valuation is such a, uh, you know, a, a, a tough question, you know, like, and, um, you know, if, if things overvalue, are they undervalued? Um, I don't know who has the, I don't think no, anybody has the answer to that. You know, I think, I think it's just is important though in the space to repeat that. Do I think personally, do I think you should have, you know, a hundred percent of your, uh, worth or, or portfolio in NFTs? No, like I think they're way too volatile for that. Uh, that just that, that's the nature of. You shouldn't have one hundred percent of your portfolio in any one thing. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Well, stop. Not investment advice, but yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah any last words before we, we go? We're we're right. good. Okay. I want to thank thanks thank please thank our uh, our, our uh, panelists. Thank you.